Soji has a stuffed monster named Squoogey. Hugh walks around like he owns the place, and we are brought back to Voyager Season 1, Episode 10. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing a review of Picard Season 1, Episode 6, called The Impossible Box. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Just getting over a little sickness, so bear with me, everybody, but I'm going to make it through. And I am not getting through a sickness, so... <laughs> I think we'll be just fine. Uh, at least half of us will be. So um, we had a pretty fun episode today. Pretty, uh, all the, the early reviews from people on the internet, everybody online was clamoring. A lot of people were saying it was their favorite episode so far. What do you think? Do you agree with that? Yeah. I would say it is my favorite episode so far. Really? Uh, uh, yeah. I think the storylines are developing and picking up. I mean, it's really close because the last one was also right up there. I like the last episode as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I would say these last two episodes were starting to kick off the adventures of Picard. And I like the way things are starting to unravel. They brought in Seven of Nine last episode and brought in a nice twist into the storyline with that Vegas kind of atmosphere. And now we're here uh, on the reclaimed artifact. Right. And I feel like there was a lot of good storyline here. There were a bunch of uh, kind of loose ends that they tied up with the history of Picard and the board. They expanded upon his, you know, feeling now uh, about the Borg and, you know, the uh, fear he had actually by going on, this, on the, uh, the queue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think it's, I think I liked uh, episode five better than this one, uh, a little bit better. Um, but most people, it seems like most of the people that, we're posting, we're saying that this was their favorite one so far. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, oh, one of the things I wanted to say, but I guess I didn't put in the top three was that I felt like, I felt like we got a, a good new uh, nickname for Agnes. I think it was her college nickname. I wanted to call her aggressive Aggie. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that scene uh, with her in Rios. Yeah. Yeah, that was a nice little scene. And there was a moment where she took Rios's hand and started walking him forward. Right. And I think I think every guy can kind of remember a moment like that. When, <laughs> when you're getting led by the hand and you know what's about to happen next. So Yeah, I mean the and and she she was such a like she was a woman on a mission. She had like a one track mind. I mean it's funny, like the second she walked in, you knew what the scene was going to be about, you know, because the dude's all like shirtless and sweaty. And by the way, I know we're kind of going backwards here, but it's, it, that's kind of a weird workout, isn't it? Just like a dude just kicking a ball around like. Uh, uh, well, you know, <laughs> shout out to his soccer skills. He did the one trick where you kick the ball up and you wrap your foot around and kick it back again. A very difficult trick that I think we saw Freddie Adu do do back in the day a long time ago right uh, and a lot of others you know premier level soccer players do so I, I thought that was pretty interesting it just shows that he uh, he obviously really does play soccer uh, and have the kind of skills that's not something you can fake right I was trying to look for a, a stunt double just in case but I, that was him uh, or at least I was fooled um, but that's, I mean, Star Trek likes to do that. They, they ask them what kind of hidden talents do you have? You know, like Jonathan Frakes is like, I can play the trombone. So they're like, put it in there, you know, or seven of nine, uh, you know, Jerry Ryan and Robert Picardo are like, we can sing. All right, stick it in there somehow, you know? And so, you know, uh, Santiago Cabrera obviously can play soccer, by the way, I guess this is the right time to do another correction with we have a couple corrections so uh, uh, yeah as usual um 
One is that somebody was saying, uh, somebody from Chile was saying that Santiago Cabrera is actually a Chilean actor, which is true. And that when he was saying those bad words as the, the pilot, he was actually speaking Chilean. And he even described what the words were and that sounded very accurate. So that's a second correction on that. We're gonna go with that, that he's Chilean. So that's why the, when, when you mentioned the soccer skills, okay, that's, the Chileans are, uh, they, they do like their soccer, let's put it that way. Um, yeah. Another another correction is the Voyager militia really came out in droves on our last week when I said that uh, Naomi Wildman was one of the Borg children. She was not one of the Borg children. That was Mazzotti, another little girl, along with these two twin boys and a baby that we never see again. Uh, Naomi Wildman was the first baby born on Voyager. And let me tell you, half of our comments were telling us <laughs> How wrong, <laughs> how dare I call yes. Naomi or Mazzotti. Uh. <laughs> we hear you and thank you for the correction. Lastly, Aaron Harvey, who's a great graphic designer, cool guy, tells us that, remember how in the image, I guess I could bring it up, in the image behind me uh, from Stardust City, it said Quark Bar, not Quarks, right? Right. And I made a comment saying like, you know, why did they, why did they omit, omit the S? And he pointed out that if you look closely on that K, if you look closely on that K, there's a tiny apostrophe and a tiny S. So, oh, wow. so it's like quark is big and the little apostrophe S is tiny. So oh. it's all good there. All wow, bases that's, covered. <laughs> that's, that's great. And actually, it actually said and ROMs underneath, but quarks and robs, but <laughs> even robs was even smaller in yeah. fun. Um, I, I think he had a 0.0001% partnership. Uh, that's funny. That's great to know. And Chilean, I got to get up on my uh, Chilean recognition skills. Let's see, see if we can see it here. Uh... Yeah, so you see there's a, that tiny little white dot. That's the, the apostrophe, and that tiny little white dot is the S. Okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> so there well, it we, is. Were, we, we were right on Mr. Mott's, though, right? Oh, yeah. Mr. Yeah. No, no, for sure. Mr. Mott's. Uh, and what does, that say, what does that say to your, to your right? That looks like a record store. Is that legible? Because yeah, I, I wanted to read that the first time. It's just something like, it looks like T.R. Taylor. Is that Taylor? Well, let's... D Dabo Taylor? Yeah. Let's Tavern. Maybe Tavern. Tavern. Dabo Tavern. Something like that. Yeah. I could check. I can try to zoom in here. That's see. my guess. Something like... Can't make out the first one, but I think the second word is tavern. It's uh, oh, Dabo tables. That's what it says. Oh, Dabo tables. Oh, Dabo. oh, Cork, Cork's got a business across the street too. He's From competing Dabo with tables. himself. <laughs> Maybe he's got both. So that's uh, that is so funny. I can't believe I never noticed that. Good eye. Yeah, Dabo tables. Dabo that's tables. That's a third thing right there. Yeah. All right, we're 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 moving along. If we can just make out that actress, that's that's uh, the yeah, giant size actress going on right there. Yeah, then we could have a trifecta. But that's pretty good. Dabo tables. We made that out. So back to the lesson at hand. Back to the lesson. The impossible box. The impossible burger. Um, I was looking for usually when they have a title like that, it it, it has a meaning twice sometimes three times. The first one was the box that, you know, obviously is if impossible for Rizzo to open and Nerald or Narek or whatever his new name is. Um, Nerald. Yeah. Uh, by the way, his new name is, is Rayan. Rayan. He pronounced, I swear he pronounced Rayan the same yeah. way my French, uh, my, my French family members pronounce my name Ryan so it's like oh this guy just 
So now I'm, just, I'm sharing a name with Nerald now. He just sounds like my French relatives. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't figure out what the other box was because it's usually an analogy, you know, or metaphor for two things. Maybe the impossible box is the Borg cube. I don't know. Maybe uh, Soji herself is the impossible box. Like she's, she was the, the difficult thing to figure out the puzzle, just like, you know, but Narek was able to figure out the puzzle in the box and in Soji. So I think maybe that's the double metaphor, you know, that she in the box were the impossible thing to unlock yeah that could be it i mean you that could be also the meditative room where they were where they were doing the unlocking right. of our memories right the, right like a hypnotization kind of ceremony and, and yeah no definitely and, and you know another thing to nitpick about and i'm sorry but there are a few things like that kind of you know made my nerd hair stand up a little bit you know, like, so there's this alien race called Romulans, and they have this way of hypnotizing each other, right? Or, or almost like a past life regression for dreams. And it works for them. Number one, we don't know if their brain physiology is the same as humans, right? So how do we know that just because it works for them, that that psychology or brain physiology works on other aliens? And number two, even more so, who's to say it's going to work on an Android? Like, like yeah, that's, that's you, know, you can, you can, I, you can hypnotize a person supposedly, but can you hypnotize your, your dust buster or what are those things? Those Roombas that go around your floor and, and vacuum your, your house. Yeah, I think they, but they kind of alluded to that a little bit when they said, uh, uh, what's his name again? No work, no work. Narek. What? Narek. Nerald. Nerald. When Nerald was saying that there's a half human, half synthetic part of her, so he was actually saying he can access her through the human side of her. Right. And, I, and, and I thought that they gave just a little bit, that gave a little bit of uh, plausibility to why he was able to kind of get into a psyche. Uh, that human side of her. Uh, and just going back to what you were talking about, the impossible box, to add another suggestion on what it could possibly be, sure. was uh, inner chamber of the board cube, which was the queen's lair that uh, they actually teleported from. Right? And I think, <clears throat> I think towards the end there, when Picard walked into the room, he said, this is the queen's lair. Yeah, know? yeah. And they made a little reference there to like, yeah, you've never you've never been here either, but we both know about it because of the collective hive mind mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And that's also another thing where basically, yeah, they're saying, look, you don't have to have been there or have had, had experienced it to have the knowledge of it. And a cute little, you know, reference to that was when they're running, they're like running away. And just some, some random Borg dude comes out of the closet and goes, Locutus, hey. <laughs> like, yeah. Hey, hey, look, it's Locutus. You know, they probably yeah. never met, but, you know, he just recognized him. So that was really cool. Yeah, that, it, it's interesting because I guess it, it, it brings me to a place where when they extract the, the Borg out of you and they remove it, they don't remove the memory of the experience. Is that is that what we're looking at? So... Right. You still, you're, you are now outside of the hive. You're back to being an individual, but you still remember everything that you went through, right? They don't right. go through the erasing your memory part. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I thought that was, I thought that was interesting that uh, Picard is having to battle with these inner demons inside of him, that he's facing his fear by going to the very place that, scarred him the most in his life right mm -hmm. and he's walking in there and this guy this actor who played his friend when he greets him can you tell us a little bit about him yeah jonathan del arco um he plays hugh uh i believe he was in you know three episodes in, in next generation i mean really like two and a tiny morsel of a third uh the first one 
I don't even remember what it was called. Like, I think it might've been just called Hugh. I don't remember the, the, our Star Trek fans can tell us in the comments below, but what he was, was he was a rescue board drone. They, they rescued him and they had this dilemma. If we kill this, uh, this Borg, like if we send like a virus in his brain, uh, like a computer virus, it could shut down the entire collective, right? So they're like, well, we should do that. But then that board drone started to show signs of like a personality and befriend Jordy, played by LeVar Burton. And so it became like this moral dilemma. And then Jordy actually gave him a name and then, you know, which was Hugh. And then Hugh actually, you know, really started to befriend Jordy. And, you know, then Picard makes the choice that, um, he can't kill him and he can like release him or wh whatever they did. They, they released him off to the, the Borg wild or whatever it was. And so then of course he's reprimanded by a superior saying, look, if you have a, the option to rid the Federation of a mortal threat next time you do it, I don't care if you're worried about hurting one person, you know, um, I think that was, the the, you see the Federation reprimands the guard, right? The so Admiral, I, go. I think it was probably Admiral Nechev. They love to have her reprimand him, but yeah, because Borg could destroy all the Federation and instead P Picard stuck with his conscience, which was don't kill this one guy, even if it means saving the whole Federation. We all know Cisco kind of looks at things a little differently <laughs> than that. Cisco's like, burn the fucker. <laughs> as long as I didn't see it, it didn't matter that much. Yeah. So anyway, and then he comes back later as Data's, uh, in like, there, there's like this, this story with Data's brother, Lore, and some, some rogue leftover uh, Borgs. And these Borgs are, have been kind of like, sent awry because Hugh had his individualism and it kind of spread in a weird way. But anyway, so that's the character. And now he's here. part of the reclamation team that's, that's helping take other people, remove them from the board uh, collective, right? Right. Exactly. Interesting. Uh, what I thought was interesting also in this episode, and I don't know if they had played on this before, but was when Picard was walking uh, through the hallways, the wall started to kind of uh, move. Those little cubes, pieces in the walls. It felt like they were alive almost, like the walls. So, oh, I didn't even notice that. Good eye. Um, yeah, that was pretty interesting. Just was, it, was it like, like computer kind of digital buttons going around or was it like the actual walls kind of shifting and moving around? Uh, well, it could have been part of just the uh, Picard's psyche when he was feeling the nerves of getting on the ship and, and going walking down the hallways. But it seemed as if the uh, wall itself was like this, this, these various squares and rectangles were moving in and out. Uh, perhaps that was my own imagination, but that's what I saw. Okay. Who directed this episode? I don't think it was shot out. Um. I'll have to check because I didn't get the name. It was a name I didn't recognize. Let me uh, check right now. It's a lot of John Briggs production. I like the line where Soji says, you think everyone is hiding a secret? And uh, Meryl's like, everyone is hiding a secret. There are a lot of really good lines in there and I can't wait to get into them, but I am just obsessed with finding out who this director is now. Yeah. of the impossible box 8.2 rating very good it was directed by maja vervillo really interesting name maja vervillo i can't even say who that is i, I wouldn't know i, I have no uh, reference also directed hawaii 5 a bunch of episodes 30 in fact cold case 50 episodes of that some Law and Order, The Agency, lots of TV. Oh, wait, yeah. no, that's, that's editor. Oh, no wonder the editing was so good. <laughs> <laughs> also edited uh, one of the short treks, episode Runaway, some Hawaii 5.0, of course, 
a Discovery episode, MacGyver, Magnum PI, Prison Break, Titans, SWAT, lots of stuff. So um, actually, we're going to need to go to a break in just a minute or two here. But um, before we do, uh, one other thing about uh, what the internet was saying late last night was our friend Andre Kotman. You know Andre Kotman, right? Uh, we went and saw some Discovery episodes at his yep. place. Um, he pointed out correctly that the alien that was mentioned at the very end, the Sicarians. Now the Sicarians, remember at the very end when they were going into that, that room to transport away? It was that uh, spatial trajectory. They said, oh, that's when the Borg. Uh, yeah, they got this advanced technology from the. Sicarians, yeah, they assimilated Sicarians. the Sicarians. Yeah. The Sicarians were actually introduced in season one, episode 10 of Voyager. And uh, they had that technology and Voyager was like, cool, can we use it? And didn't really work out. And then when they tried to take it, the technology wasn't compatible with other technologies, so it didn't work, but apparently the Borg were able to figure it out because they're computer nerds. Okay, so this is something, another little nugget where they pick up from an, uh, an existing episode and expand yep. on it. Every episode has tons of this stuff now. It's great. Um, but we're going to go to a break very quickly, and we're going to come right back with the seventh rule. Hey everybody and welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. My name is Ryan T. Husk. We are reviewing The Impossible Box. That is episode six of Picard's first season. Pretty cool, pretty awesome. Let's go through the whole episode now. We're kind of all over the place. We had a few good laughs on the break just now. <laughs> a few good laughs. Uh, so the episode starts off with Soji's dream. She wakes up. Yeah, open like a horror story, actually. I thought I was watching the raw. I was like, this is not the right show. Actually, <laughs> there was a second there when, when I was watching the beginning of this where I thought it was a trailer for another movie and I was trying to skip ahead. So I actually looked on the screen to see if I had to skip ahead. I thought this wasn't the right movie. Maybe it pressed the wrong thing. Really? Yeah, because I this is a horror movie. This is like a, this isn't, a, this isn't the right thing, is it? And sure enough, it was, and I gave this a chance. Uh, you know, I can agree with the fans about this being one of the better episodes, and I think it's only going to get better from here because we have now have lift off as a, as a right. franchise. You know? Yeah, I mean, we're already six out of ten episodes in, so we're more than halfway. So this story has already been more than halfway told. Um, but, yeah. I mean, now that things have, are getting already mixed up, you know, like characters are, are meeting and it's no longer a separation between the, what's going on in, the, in the, the cube and what's going on on the ship. You know, they're already kind of intermingling and switching around. So, um, you know, and I don't want to keep jumping all over the place, but uh, there was one thing I really, really want to say that I like. Yeah. It was, it was the shot where, Picard is looking at, you know, he's just computer, bring up, uh, search the artifact, the treaty, and the board. And he's looking oh, through the files. That was the best shot. And, of and the best shot is when he sees himself as the board and he's looking at himself through. And the way they overlap the two is just, it's just great to me. I thought it was really nice. Yeah. It kind of was blurry it for a second and then you boom, it clicks into an overlap and you can see it. And he starts to grab his own face because he feels it there. Mm. You know, it's like, so good. Uh, it was just a great moment, great shot. Uh, they, you know, Im Im implemented the uh, translucent computer screen uh, over his face and I thought the reflection of his face, which I just thought was really well done. Shout out to, you know, the director and, and those people that were involved with coming up with that particular insert. No, I agree. That was the, the best shot of the night. Um, it, it was really cool. It was really well executed. Um, and it, it was just, you know, it, it had, a, you know, obviously a, a, a lot of meaning there, you know, for, for the character Picard and, and for us when we're seeing it, especially because it wasn't just the first time that we've seen these, these screens and, and the angle of, of, of looking at them through the screen. 
Um, so we'd seen that before, but this was the first time that it like was so poignant. It had a, it had a reason for it, you know, other than just like looking cool. And, yeah, it had a know, reason. And there was, and there was also the, the contrast between the old Picard and the younger version of himself, the board version of him and the non board. There, there was just so much contrast there. And I, I just thought it told the story just within a shot. It didn't need much dialogue. It just, that was enough. Um, they also do a, a little thing where they hint the theme song for Next Generation every every once in a while when they cut and they end the act. And I love that little, just that little bit of a theme song music being played from Next Generation. One side here, that's two notes. It doesn't take much, but it gets me hyped up when I hear it. I just like the way they suddenly planted in there. And it's made it. Right, right. Uh, they, they put in Voyager uh, at a point like one or two episodes ago, the Voyager theme song for a second there. This one, we definitely heard the Next Generation one. Really well done. And I wonder, uh, I was looking up Maja a little bit. I don't know, it might be pronounced Maha because it says she's, she speaks Spanish. So maybe it's pronounced Maha. Uh, okay. But uh, she's, she's clearly a, a well-known editor. I mean, her, her list of, of editing credits was extensive. And that's why we noticed how great the editing was in this episode is because it was being directed by uh, a lady that's made at least half her bread on editing. And that's why there was kind of like during the dream sequences and all these other dramatic points, there was kind of like the flashes of, of the back and forth, you know, that's really good editing as, especially when uh, accompanied with, with the sound editing and all that. So shout out to her. I kind of want, it makes me want to learn more about her, you know? She uh, held her own on this one and really uh, laid down a great episode that the fans responded to. Uh, you know, it's a culmination of everybody's work, but, you know, uh, the director takes the lead on a lot of that. also want to say that Michelle Hurd gives a fantastic performance in this one when, you know, she charms Starfleet into letting them get the, uh, the medical visitor's pass. And also when she's in bed and she has that really heart to heart scene with uh, Rios. I like the emotion she showed in there. And she's just a hell of a good actor, actually, I have to say. Yeah, I've been, uh, I was sold on her after the fourth episode. It took me a couple episodes to, to make up my mind, but she really, she's really shining. You know, within every scene, with every moment, she, uh, it's like she's able to carry her emotions like right in front of her. So her emotions precede everything she says and does in every scene. Uh, really good actress. She's, she's, what, what it seems like is that she seems really genuine, you know? She seems genuine and she reminds me a lot of Kira where she doesn't take any BS from anybody and she's tough. And I like that about her. She's tough and she doesn't take any BS, but she also has uh, good intentions. You can mm -hmm. tell that by her relationship with JL. <laughs> Don't you ever <laughs> call him that again. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, I, which I think is one of the worst nicknames. But. Everybody does. <laughs> Yo, JL doesn't blow off the tongue for some reason. Um, <laughs> but no, um, I also like the set, set design. Um, they really gave me a, a, a back view of the bedroom set mm -hmm. where uh, Soji was making love with Nerald. Yeah. And that set is awesome. I like the ceiling. I like the way the walls and the ceiling kind of arched out into each other with the lights. Um, Really fantastic set design. You, uh, the guys make it really believable. The Borg cube just feels ominous as they walk down the hallways. It feels endless. And I don't feel like I've seen this same part of the set twice already. Right. It feels like I keep getting a new set. Um, so I want to give a you know uh, a really good shout out to these people doing the set design, including Rafi's uh, quarters. Her, her little bunk area where she sleeps. It's just all 
seems very seamless and it has a good feel on the eye. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that. I agree. High quality. Uh, I'm sure they have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting about the production design and how to make it perfect and what exactly they're going for and, and what specific colors will be a theme of every area. I mean, it's just, you know, it's masterful. I mean, that, you know, we can, we can nitpick quite a few things. I haven't really found anything to nitpick so far about the, the production design or the locations have been great. Everything's been- Or the, cool. or the visual effects, right? Visual effects are awesome. Yeah. Costume is doing great. Makeup is doing well. How about how about this? Let's break up this this love fest, and I'm gonna <laughs> rather rather than it, it won't be nitpicking, but it, it is one funny thing that somebody uh, mentioned online last night. I thought this was the the quote of the night. Uh, David Negret says uh, when. Uh, with regards to the scene where, where Narek is nibbling on her ear in bed or whatever, he says, scandalous. She's only 37 months old. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. uh, yeah. 37 months old. Uh, yeah. So yeah it's, <laughs> you know, it's that there were nitpicking wise. There were a few issues that, you know, I guess he needed her to walk around that little maze thing and then he wanted to kill her and it was like... Well, because he wanted to, they need to find out where her home world is. Right. That's the whole point because obviously, I mean, I'm guessing they want to destroy the synth home world and destroy the synths and it's hidden and that information was trapped inside of her, maybe like a little homing beacon. And they were able to extract that information from her, and now they've got it, and so now they can go destroy that uh, synth homeworld. And so that'll probably be Picard's mission: is to stop that from happening because synths are people too. Right, they are. Uh, they're half people, at least. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know. I did think that there was a little bit of a little ritualistic type of thing with that whole uh, scene where she's walking on the thing. It reminded me of a lot of movies that I've seen that kind of show these kinds of rituals. One hmm. was Golden, Golden Child with Eddie Bear. So, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, there's another thing that I thought does not quite work for me. Um, baby Elrond, right? Uh, AKA Elnor. So he works for me. He's great. He's nice. He's cool. Good character. We get it. We understand what's going on here. Um, but, and, and I, I understand the, the comic value for him. He's going to be the fish out of water character. He's the character that, you know, has that, that, um, innocence to him that that innocent ignorance to him where he doesn't get the joke you know like data doesn't get the joke you know when they say something or uh spock says like what's so funny about that i don't get it you know he's going to be yeah. that guy and so every time and, and it's comedy gold that every time he just says what he thinks it's going to be funny because we don't usually say that yeah I'm, just, I'm not on that really yet he hasn't sold me on his character as big, even the funny guy who's awkwardly funny because he says the blood truth. I still haven't laughed at any of his punchlines yet. Except, <laughs> <laughs> I just haven't. I mean, but uh, except for the last line he says, which is off camera, but he says, please, my friends choose to live. Right. And that was the only line that I actually, you know, thought was pretty good. Um, him calling out the awkward tension in the room and all that. It just, it just, he still looks like one of the elves from from the uh, the elf world. He's gonna look like that forever. He's from Rivendell. That's all there is. To <laughs> exactly. It. But that's okay. I love Lord of the Rings. Shout out to my boy J.R.R. Tolkien if he's R -R. listening. Of course know. he's listening. He always <laughs> he's, he's listening fifty yes. years after the grave. Uh, but I'll tell you uh, that line where he says, you know, the, the whatever the tension was. Um, that worked for me. That one, that's the first one that landed. Um, when, when he looks at aggressive Aggie, uh, and he says, the obvious tension between you makes me uneasy. That kind of worked for me. That would, that worked. but I'll tell you what hasn't worked. And, and 
a lot of people may not have noticed it because I didn't understand what he said until I put it on the closed captioning to say, what, what the hell did he just say? So, by the way, guys, pro tip, these Romulans are using a ton of words that are not in English. So if you want to know what the hell they're talking about, put on the closed <laughs> captioning sometimes. Oh, I thought I was understanding everything perfectly. No. <laughs> so uh, the, what he was saying was, he was saying, uh, look, he said something and they kind of looked at him like, you know, don't, you don't want to know the answer. And he says, looks like that's not my business. I shall out, but out, no. but instead, instead of, I guess, but out oh. so that they're using that innocence. Like, Oh, he, he said the wrong thing. He meant, but out, but he said, out, yeah, but. that didn't land. And then there was another line, same exact thing, except he said, uh, Am I am I in budding? Am I in budding? You know, like budding in. Like, yeah, these are these are tough. <laughs> they made the joke twice. It, they they should have made it. <laughs> they they should have made him a mute. If you want to know the truth, uh, it probably would have sold better if he was a telepath or something. And he just, it just, you know, he didn't talk much. But you know, those are the kind of things where. You never know. People are going to start picking it up, and and the nerds are going to be in the nerd forms, going like, "Hey, don't mind to be in budding, but oh, here we go." <laughs> here yeah. we go. Uh, no, I'm not sold on it. it it's, uh, but he did he did deliver another line that I actually wrote down here, and that's when uh, Picard told him, "I told you to stay on the ship," and he just bluntly said, "I didn't listen." You know stating the obvious but right <laughs> very <laughs> but, I like, but i liked it i don't know why i like that one for some reason and just kind of like how you knew that when picard said do not come after me or what you know he says do not follow me onto the ship no matter what you knew you're yeah. like okay he's gonna go he's well he didn't say okay which means he knew that he was gonna right he, he can't lie right is that what it is it's like uh, absolute candor so he he can't really be lying. So if he had said yes, then he wouldn't be able to show up. The fact that he didn't agree and say, okay, fine, right. I won't come after you, means that he had in his mind. That's if, a good point. If, if I need to, I'm going to be there. He even shook his head, too. He, he just kind of shook his head and walked away. Right. <laughs> He's like, right. He didn't give an answer. He was like, hmm. Yeah. I'll decide. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see about that, Captain. Uh, there was also uh, the scene where uh, Nerald is leading Soji through the path and all that stuff. And his sister lover, Rizzo, uh, is watching from, you know, from her, you know, computer quarters or whatever it was from her office. And I just kind of noticed, you know, as an actor, we know how hard it is to act by yourself. If you are you're just looking at a green screen and they're like, okay, now he's saying this. So react, you know, give us a reaction or do it's not easy. It's, it's tough. Um, especially when, you know, there's a lot of characters involved in this case, there weren't. Uh, so it wasn't even, you know, even harder than it could have been, but I just want to give a little shout out to her, the lady playing Rizzo because she was doing it well, you know, she's like kind of, tilts in her head. I mean, it's hard to do a scene without actually working with somebody. You're just doing reactions, you know, and I thought she did that well. Yeah, she also makes me hate her really well. I, I really hate her for some reason. Every time I see her like this, <laughs> B-I-T. And yeah, so she's she's selling that part. I think that's pretty good. Um, I, I thought the line was funny when Rafi was talking to Starfleet and the woman from Starfleet said, you know the Romulans, they're in a 250-year bed. <laughs> no, so she actually had two really good lines. That was, that was the first one. She said the Romulans are in a 250-year bad mood. Solid, well-written, well-delivered. Yeah. And the other one, she says, I'm saying this as an old friend. Never call me again. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah. that, that, came right after, that came right after Rafi says, I'm still planning on drinking myself to death which I also thought was like a hilarious line. Um, and then they took a, uh, a stab at Picard when she says, you know, Picard, if it's not ego, it's his id. Yeah, right? raging it or something his like that. His raging it or something like that, yeah. 
and uh, he does his he he had several eye rolls. You know, uh, another one of all all of my favorite lines were in that scene. You're right. The other one that was really good was you know she was she's trying to convince the the admiral or the captain, and she's like, "Come on, Picard is so Federation." His face is probably still on the damn brochures. <laughs> yeah, that's on the brochures. yeah, that's great. That's all. That's all writing gold right there. Writing gold, well delivered, well directed. Everything that was a perfect scene. I thought. I thought that was great. Yeah, and you know, also another scene I want to go back to was the scene with uh, uh, Rafi and Rios. I think she calls him Chris, but it's, it sounded like she called him Chris. But I guess probably, she that's calls his him. name, Cristobal Rios. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she, she says to him, you know, I have a son, you know, did you know that about me? You know, basically opening up to him and saying, you know, you think you know somebody, but you didn't know this about me. And this is something that I've kept secret, you know? Right. Uh, I think that was a good kind of a bonding moment. Actually, at that moment, I thought he was going to sleep with her too. And I thought, God, this guy's just... <laughs> Going all out. There was a there was a little possibility there for a second where we're like, hang on, everybody just relax, okay? Yeah, just poor calm, Elmore. Calm poor down. Baby Elrond's gonna be like, no mas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Don't yeah. tell him where I'm staying. Uh, <laughs> Not many places to go, baby Elrond. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, because he walked her to the bed and sat next to her, and I was like, uh oh, gosh, this guy's going two for two. What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> Have you no morals? Have you no lies? Now, so. uh, uh, un- undoing that a little bit, going backwards, just another uh, scene or two. We did talk about aggressive Aggie, um, but I want to talk about that scene a little bit because it, that was also, it was well written. Even though the second she walked in, you felt that we knew what was going to happen, but that's, you know, that's, that's partially in the writing that just that they, that the scene that was set up and partially in the directing that the mood that you just kind of see a dude, he's like sweaty. She walks in with the, also the acting, just the look in her eye, you know, she just kind of was focused uh, like a, just a different look, but it played out really well because she just kind of comes in like a woman possessed. She just basically walks up and just starts making out with the dude but then there's that fun line where she says, uh, I have a superpower, which is I know when I'm doing a mistake as I'm doing it or something like that, right? Yeah, that actually, that scene made me think of why she was doing that. And it, it almost made me feel like she was hooking up with him to erase the memory of what she had just did, killing, uh, what's his name? Yep, exactly the character that they've been looking for this whole time. Yeah, right? Bruce Maddox, exactly. Maddox, yeah. So I felt like, okay, in order to like get the Maddox thing off my mind, I have to go, I'm going to go sleep with this guy mm-hmm. and kind of uh, change the topic. <laughs> Jeez, that's, that's exactly right. She And she even admits that because when she says it's a mistake and she stops and then Rios is kind of like, shit, how do I get her? By the way, how does she even know that Rios wanted to hump her? Like she just walks up. What if he goes, whoa, whoa, hey, I'm married, dude. I just don't wear my ring because I'm playing soccer and I don't want to lose it, you know, but just relax. Who says it, you know, but let's move on past that. Uh, he says, after she kisses and says it's, it's a mistake, she says, or, you know, she says it's a mistake and he goes, well, how are you feeling? And she says, you know, that she's not feeling great. But then Rios kind of gives her an out when uh, he says, are you sure this is going to help? And she says, you know, for a few hours at least or something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it'll get her mind off of it for a few hours and help. He was like, I'll, I'll oblige. Um, that's what I'm here for. Right, right. So that's, so you're right. That's, she's trying to erase that. And, you know, and, and the other thing that she says, which was, uh, she says, oh, I don't, why do you like it in space? It's cold out here. And my first thought was, you're saying how cold it is. Dude is just in his shorts. You're in a tank top. It doesn't really, it doesn't really look cold. <laughs> yeah, that's just, he's, that's just he's a gonna, line. <laughs> yeah, I think she meant that it's cold and that it's, it's lonely in that kind of a way. And it's one of the things that I actually thought about while watching this episode. I was thinking about my old time on DS9. 
and then I thought about uh, the scene where they show uh, Meryl uh, coming out of the bedroom bed with uh, Soji, mm-hmm. and he kind of has his shirt off, he's putting his clothes back on, and I realized he had a farmer's tan, right? Where, you know, <laughs> so, I and, and, I only, and I I know this sounds weird, but I was thinking to myself, how do you get a farmer's tan in space? Right. Right. It's almost impossible, right? Because we don't get to see the sun, right? Um, and that's one of the things that uh, I thought about was living on a space station and not being able to see the sun. And that's what I think when you say uh, some place is cold, it's cold out here in space. Or mm-hmm. I think that our bodies are used to seeing the sky and the sun. And, you know, you hear about astronauts that go to the International Space Station and well, one of the things that they miss is just seeing the sun. Sure. Like, I mean, well, they, they still see the sun, but not the way we do. They not just, not the way we do. That with the blue bright sky. Ball, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, and, and space is extremely cold, but that's outside of the ship. You know, they've got their, their things, um, their environmental controls, but... Yeah, I mean, you're right. Astronauts, they have all these psychological and physical things that they need to overcome, uh, obstacles that they need to overcome while they're in space. Uh, but I guess in, in the time of Star Trek, they've kind of figured out some of those things with, with artificial gravity, with uh, environmental controls and inertial dampeners and all that kind of nerdy stuff. Sure, sure. And I mean, you can always beam yourself up to a planet surface if you want to get the feeling uh, exactly or you can go into a hollow suite and figure out a program that'll get you wherever you want to go and you can still get that feel so there's other ways around it it's just that I can understand the coldness of it and I can also understand the difficulty of getting a farmer's tan in <laughs> space yeah I wonder how they do that. So what is this uh, place with two red moons? That's got to be where their home world is because that was kind of like the clue inside of her dream. He says, that's, that's what Nerald, Narek was trying to get the entire time was where the, the, the home world is. And so he says, look out of the skylight. She looks out of the skylight. She sees two red moons that she said were blood red, but they were obviously light orange. And uh, she looks up two red moons. So that way his sister sees, hears that. She uh, immediately says, find me planets that have two red moons and constant electrical storms, even though it could have just been lightning. But that's, so now they're going to try to find the home world based on that. Okay. And I, I was doing my best to find out where Data fits into the mix as her father. Hmm. Uh, uh, while I was watching this episode, I was thinking, okay, well, is Data her father or or, or, or Maddox? Like, who who was the who is the person that she sees as her father in those dream sequences? Right, right. That's a good point. I I was wondering if it was going to end up being Bruce Maddox, or if it was going to be just or if it's just going to be some faceless person that we never find out. I don't know. I don't think we're supposed to know. No, I thought it was going to be Data. So I thought Data was the dad, but I guess we're going to have a whole Glory Bobage episode after this one. So <laughs> <laughs> seven. Data, you will not the father. Uh, so we've got about one minute left. Um, I feel like this episode, we went over through like kind of like a combination pizza. There's just kind of like stuff sprinkled all over the place. There is. There is. Yeah. Um, oh, I'll you know what you, Oh. Go ahead. I was just going to say there are there are a few of the trivioids that that missed the uh, didn't make it through the cutting room. One was Hugh walks around like he owns the place because they just right. walked into her into her apartment or her room. Like, what what if she's you know taking a dump or what if she's you know, <laughs> having sex with some like what's you just walk? She in does have room? sex a lot, so that's just she does. very possible. They could have you know. Uh, so oh Soji, we got that. Oh Soji sees the past the orchids. I thought that was cool. She can't see past the orchids usually. That was something yeah. cool, something poetic there. 
and mm. also her and the and with her mom you know that was another thing that i picked up on early on was the conversations with her mom felt very awkward i think that was from the first episode right right Definitely when she was right. on the when she was on the run she called the card first she didn't call her mom and you remember, you remember that? She, oh, she no, you're on, absolutely right. Yeah, that was yeah, Dodge. Yeah. When Dodge was on the run, she called Picard first, not her mom. But then when she spoke to her mom, her mom knew that she talked to Picard. And I was like, this is something's weird with the mom situation. And I think that is another aspect of the story that is going to reveal itself going forward. Uh, who the mom is uh, or what the mom is and what the function and purpose of that they play. So what you're trying to say is that she's going to say, not the mama. Am I right? <laughs> not the mama. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> not the mama. No. no it's been a long no, day. No. <laughs> Just got longer. Just yeah. got longer. Um, well, that's cool. I'm sure there's a lot more stuff, but uh, we're out of well, time. What was the, thir the third point you, co you, you covered? I think that was all of them. That was always I think, all of them. Yeah, I think that was all of them. Narek sounds like my French relatives. We found out. Dr. Gerardi's college nickname. Uh, yeah. At least that's what I think it is or was. Uh, the quote of the night comes from a, a Facebook comment. Oh, there was another quote that was really good. But I don't know if I remember it. There are a lot of good quotes in there. A lot of good things. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, just a nitpick here, and I, and I, you know, I haven't really given this one a hard nitpick because I did like the episode, but. Rafi asked the question, what does the Tal Shiar need from a Sith? Mm -hmm. And I and I thought to myself, wouldn't that be a question you would have asked, like, from the beginning, really? Right. When, when they were hunting down her sister, what would they need from her? I exactly. felt like that would, yeah, so that, that question should have been but, asked. Well, that's kind of what, I guess that was... Picard was kind of asking it or trying to figure it out, but you're right. Rafi, that's kind of the first time she brings it up. And the reason she asked that, the, or it's written that way, is for our benefit, for us to think that, because in this episode it is revealed that what they want with her is to find out where the home world is. Um, and the, the final quote that I wanted to bring up, because I thought it was really good as well, was when, <laughs> towards the beginning, I know we're going back and forth, um, they bring up the Borg and Agnes shows off her Borg knowledge and says the Borg are required reading in my line of work. Picard gets triggered. He starts going like, oh, they're not people, they're monsters or whatever. <laughs> and he says, they don't change, they metastasize. Yeah. That's, that's very good. It, it, it shows exactly how he feels about them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you can feel the terror inside of his performance when he mm -hmm. was facing the prospects of having to go back there. Um, really well done on Sir John Luc Picard, Mr. Patrick Stewart's part as well. He's doing a great job of carrying this show. Uh, I don't think we give him enough credit, but I think he is doing a great job. I completely agree. And you're right, we don't give him enough credit because we kind of just expect him to be amazing like he always is. But Oh yeah, and we also focus say. on the other characters and the other storylines, but mm -hmm. we kind of take him for granted. But he is he is kind of the glue that holds all of this stuff together. He's magical. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, we want to thank you all for joining us. Drop your comments below. Please uh, subscribe. Um, listen to everything that we've ever done always we've made like over a hundred of these uh and uh support us any way you can any way you like and we will see you again very soon on the seventh rule